Good evening and welcome to the art exhibit and meet the artist event for Scott Young. This is the Virginia Beach Public Library. And I'm your host, Sandy Hopkins. I'm an adult services librarian for the Virginia Beach Public Library. And tonight I have Robert Kennedy with me. He's the volunteer art gallery coordinator for the Central Library in Virginia Beach. Welcome, Rob. Thanks very much, Sandy, and welcome to all. We are very pleased to welcome photographer Scott Young, who had a show at Virginia Beach Central Library in November 2018, and at Bayside Special Services Library, also in Virginia Beach, in August, September 2019. A native of Minnesota, Scott graduated from the College of William and Mary then completed a master's degree in social work and became a licensed clinical social worker. After spending some years working for social welfare agencies and in private psychotherapy practice, he began a 25 year career in the health insurance industry from which he retired in 2017. Scott is a fourth generation photographer and has been an avid hobbyist from his youth. He first became serious about nature and wildlife photography in the early 2000s when a pair of eagles began nesting at Norfolk Botanical Gardens. Inspired, he soon began annual trips to Florida and other locations of abundant wildlife. In recent years, he has expanded his scope to include landscape and night sky photography. Scott also became interested in digital photo post processing and began to incorporate the use of various commercial filters, textures, and techniques into his work to create unique images reflecting his distinctive artistic interpretation of a scene or subject. Scott has received personal instruction from leading professional photographers, including Denise Ippolito. Gary Carter, Matthew Studebaker, Tom Till, Robert Fawcett, and Arthur Morris. Welcome, Scott. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thanks, Rob and Sandy, for the nice introduction. I'm very honored to have the chance to participate in this virtual art show series. Um, I'm going to start by giving you a brief overview of some of the key elements of the art of bird photography. Then I'm going to show you a series of my favorite bird photographs taken over the last few years. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit of the backstory behind some of these photographs, because not only does every picture tell a story, but every story uh, has a every picture has a story behind it. So these are some of the key elements, and, and these are things that I've learned um, along the way or just developed in the field. And um, I'm just going to go through them quickly. I like to use simple backgrounds that don't distract from the main subject. I like to focus on the eye of the main subject. Uh, the eye is the most important part of uh, photographing the bird, and, and if it's uh, and if it's the focus is right on the eye. Um, then everything else sort of takes care of itself. Uh, I like to position the main light source directly behind the camera when possible, and I test that by seeing if my shadow is pointed directly at the uh, main subject. Um, before I um, press the shutter, I'm always looking uh, at the bird's head angle. Um, I like it to be perpendicular to the camera or slightly toward the camera. Um, and birds, when they interact together, have some interesting behaviors. So when I'm photographing multiple birds, I like to try and capture some of those interactions between the birds. Um, I like to use water reflections or habitat as compositional elements. Um, and uh, when I'm doing a bird portrait, uh, I try to fill up the frame with the bird. And that probably harkens back to my days of doing school photography and senior portraits. Um, I like to photograph in early morning or late afternoon light because that's uh, very diffuse light and often golden in color, and it makes for good photographs. Uh, whenever possible, I try to get low 
and try to get a uh, bird's eye view uh, right at eye level with the bird. It's not always possible, but when I can, it's much more pleasing than to photograph down or up um, when viewing the, uh, the bird. Uh, for flight shots, I try to get the bird moving into the frame uh, rather than out of the frame. Uh, if it's moving into the frame, then it's then it's a nice composition. If it's moving out of the frame, then I just get the rear end of the bird. Um, for bird photography, equ equipment matters. I'm using um, very long, fast, heavy lenses, and um, they tend to be um, on the expensive side. Also, because they're big lenses, uh, I need to use a tripod. Uh, 90 to 90 percent, 95 percent of the time, because um, any kind of camera shake or um, even even shake caused by any kind of breeze will blur the photograph. So I always use a tripod, and I make every effort not to disturb these birds as they go about their business. I feel like I'm a guest in their home, and I um, I feel like patience is required in order to um, to get the photographs I want without uh, disturbing. Uh, my subjects. So now I'm going to move into the uh, series of photographs um, that I wanted to show you today. Um, this is a great blue heron portrait. Um, these are very common birds. Um, they're very common in, in the area that I live in Virginia, uh, but they're also common really all over the country. And uh, they're very beautiful birds. They look different. Um, depending on whether they're flying or standing straight up uh, or whether they're uh, hunkered down and fishing. So they give you a lot of different looks. Um, this bird almost became extinct last century because these uh, quills that you see down on the lower left uh, side of the picture came to be very prized for use in making hats. And so they were hunted um, and they almost became extinct as a result. But the government stepped in and stopped that practice and they've recovered nicely. Um, so here we have a nice head angle, a nice background. And uh, this is what I look for in a, in a bird portrait. This was taken at Wakotahatchee, Wet, Wakotahatchee Wetlands in Delray Beach, Florida. And I'm gonna say more about that as we go along. This is an oyster catcher and, and her chick. Uh, it was taken at Nickerson Beach on Long Island in New York. Um, it's a very nice area for um, photographing nesting birds. There are a number of species of birds uh, that nest there, including terns and oyster catchers and skimmers. Um, this happens in June and July. It's a very crowded beach area, so you have to kind of work around that, but uh, it's a great place to get nice uh, photograph of, of photographs of birds in the nest and also with their young. Um, in this particular morning, I uh, noticed this nice area with uh, the dune and the foliage in the background. So um, I was looking for birds around that area and I found this uh, oyster catcher was kind of supervising um, her chick. And so I, I got down on the sand uh, flat on my stomach and I set up my camera, um, careful to keep the sand out of the mechanism which is difficult sometimes. And, uh, and I was able to, to sort of inch my way closer. Um, and as the bird sort of, the chick sort of darted around, uh, the composition came together and I got this nice uh, uh, look at the adult bird um, looking towards me and, uh, and the chick underneath the, the mother. And uh, this turned out to be, I think my favorite shot of that uh, weekend in New York. This next photograph was taken at Gatorland in Orlando, Florida. Uh, this is an area that has a huge rookery and, and also a lot of alligators. And uh, it's, it used to be a great place for bird photography. Unfortunately, the owners at some point decided to uh, put in a, uh, a zip line. And so now when you're photographing birds, you take a chance on having um, somebody zip through the photograph. So. Um, it's really not a good location anymore, but um, uh, a lot of photographers switched over to, to uh, Alligator Farm in St. Augustine as a result. Um, but at the time I was going there uh, prior to the zip line, um, I was able to get some really nice photographs in the bird rookery. Now, I really enjoyed photo photographing this uh, great egret. Uh, he seems like he's been around a while, kind of an old soul. Uh, he's got some dings on his beak and uh, it just seems like he's probably seen a lot. 
you could see the breeding plumage next to the eye and uh, I was able to get some nice definition in the feathers and uh, uh, the background is uh, composed of just uh, the foliage that's out of focus. So um, uh, this came together for me as, as a nice uh, portrait. This is uh, taken at Chincoteague National Wildlife Refuge. Um, early in my bird photography um, efforts, I started going to Chincoteague a couple times a month because there were a lot of different species uh, there to photograph much more than I could find uh, locally in the Virginia Beach area. So uh, I started going there a lot and, uh, and I've continued to do that over the last uh, 15 years or so. Um, this is a pair of turns. This is called courtship feeding. And uh, uh, it's a high key photograph, which means I was having to photograph into the light. But with these kind of photographs, I can um, get an exposure off the bird and, and just sort of let the background take care of itself and, uh, and kind of white out. And, uh, and it makes uh, for a nice contrast between the, the main subject and the background, even, even when the subject is, uh, is white like with these birds. So on this uh, particular day, I, I knew that uh, I, I came upon this um, female tern who was sitting on the perch and she was looking kind of expectant. And I know the behavior of these birds that they do this kind of uh, courtship feeding. So uh, I figured something was gonna happen and I set up my uh, long lens um, on my windowsill on a beanbag support and I, and I focused on the, on the bird and just sort of waited for something to happen. And sure enough, out of the right corner of my eye, all of a sudden this, uh, this male bird uh, started coming in with the fish. And so I followed him in and, and then took a seven shot burst just as he got near the, the female. And so I was able to catch the instant of the, um, just before the handoff. I'd like to say though, that I, I caught the shot on the first pass, but actually, the first time this bird came in, he actually knocked the, uh, the female off the perch and into the water. And so, uh, and then he lost the fish. So uh, she jumped back up on the perch and he, he went back around and caught another fish and pretty soon he came in. And that was the time that I caught this nice, uh, nice exchange here. Um, the third time he came in, he knocked her off the perch again. And so I kind of figured at the time that these are probably very young birds and they're just learning how to do this and I and I trust that they got better as time went on. Um, so that's turn courtship. This next photograph was taken at Fort DeSoto State Park, which is um, uh, near St. Petersburg. It's on, of course, the Gulf of Mexico. Um, these birds are on a sandbar and I'm having to uh, wade out into the water from the beach and set up my tripod in the water, which is always uh, uh, delicate operation um, because uh, expensive equipment going in the water is is not a good idea. Um, but in any case, I, I like to photograph uh, this sort of gaggle of birds um, on the beach or on the sandbar because they can be very interesting. And um, there are a lot of different species here. There's some uh, willets and um, some um, black skimmers and a number of different kinds of terns and a couple of kinds of uh, Seagulls, so it's sort of the range of birds that we find on the beach there at uh, Fort DeSoto. But I like to photograph them because um, invariably at some point, uh, something is gonna fly over either an eagle or a, or, a, or a hawk or something, and it's gonna spook the birds. And it's always a nice uh, shot when I'm pre-focused on, on this area where the birds are, because um, there's a lot of chaos and a lot of action. But this, this photograph was a little different because uh, this uh, group in the foreground decided to just hang around and, and not fly out. And so I was able to get a contrast between the flying birds and the, and the birds on the beach, which I thought made it made for a, a nice image. I really enjoy photographing at uh, Fort DeSoto. It's been named one of the um, best parks in America a couple of times. This is a, a kingfisher that was photographed at Chincoteague. Um, most photographers will say that this is the hardest bird that there is to photograph, and I'm no different. Um, I was uh, visiting Chincoteague for several years before I ever got my first uh, good shot of these birds because unlike some birds that uh, acclimate 
easily to people. Um, this bird is very skittish and um, and uh, is very sensitive to any kind of movement or sound. And so it's very difficult to, to get up close enough uh, to get a portrait and uh, takes a lot of patience. And uh, uh, in this case, I was able to get up close and, and capture this bird who was sitting on a rock. Um, at this at this point, the bird has got his top knot up and he's uh, just looking down in the water scanning for fish. So uh, I was able to capture this portrait. Um, this is a male kingfisher, by the way. The female has a, a big splotch of uh, brown on the on the breast. And we're going to look at another one in a few minutes. So this is an anhinga, uh, they're very common in Florida and uh, they're sort of the cousins of the cormorants that we see a lot in this area. Uh, these are, are related to the duck family and they're, they're diving birds. They dive for fish and, and for that reason, they don't have any water repellent. So after, when they come out of the water, the only way they can dry their wings is to spread them out um, on a perch in the sun and, and let them dry naturally. These birds are very skittish, um, not as bad as the kingfisher, but uh, they, they they don't acclimate acclimate well to uh, to humans even in a national park. So I was able to um, to set up my camera and tripod and just gradually move up behind the anhinga and hope that he he didn't uh, uh, spook on me. And uh, sure enough, he stayed still. And and just before I took this picture, he cooperated by turning his head perpendicular to me, and so I was able to get that nice blue color uh, around his eye and of course the yellow beak. Um, so these are very common birds, and they're and they're very they're uh, a lot of fun to see and photograph. Uh, Merritt Island is a really nice location. Um, you can photograph, and you can see the um, the rockets on their launch pads. And my wife and I have uh, have actually seen several launches from from the area. So it's a it's a really nice bird location. This is a purple gallinule. Um, it's so one of the most beautiful birds I've been able to photograph in Florida. Um, this was located, this was uh, taken at Anhinga Trail, which is is known primarily for abundance of alligators, uh, but they also have uh, quite a few birds and, the, and um, purple gallinule is one of them. Uh, there's another uh, uh, variant of uh, gallinule, which is called the common gallinule, but they're much more uh, uh, plain looking and, uh, and these are, are uh, much prettier birds. Uh, I really like the um, the orange around the beak and the red eye, and of course the the blue and turquoise on the body. Plus, you can see they have these really really big feet, um, yellow feet that they use to be able to walk on top of lily pads. It's really remarkable to watch, and they get around very easily in the, in the marsh. And uh, uh, so they, these birds are rather scarce in Florida, but. Uh, there are a few places where I see them and I always uh, enjoy trying to uh, photograph them. And of course, this is in Everglades National Park in Hinga Trail. This is, uh, of course, a bald eagle. And um, um, this was in Merritt Island. And, and while the eagles are fairly common on that park, they tend to hang around the uh, bird's nests and um, the eagle nests. And um, those are typically located pretty far from people. so. It's not uh, usual that I get to see a bald eagle in the park, but uh, on this particular morning, this uh, bird was uh, was in the one of the impoundments and was sitting on a on a mangrove bush, and uh, he, he looked kind of agitated, and I thought that he might uh, he might fly out, so I set up my uh, tripod and my camera um, and set the exposure for a flight shot and just sort of waited, and sure sure enough. After a few minutes, he took off and flew, and I was very happy to see him flying almost right towards me. So I was able to uh, pan the, the the camera on the tripod and get a focus on the eye and just sort of follow him as he went over my shoulder and get a couple of nice shots here. Um, so I was very pleased with that. This is um, another great blue heron, uh, and you'll see the chick in the nest. This was uh, taken at Vieira Wetlands which is a man-made uh, wetland park uh, as part of the water treatment process for the uh, Melbourne area. And there are a number of these parks around uh, some of the um, urban areas in Florida, and they're usually great habitats for uh, 
for birds and other kinds of wildlife. Um, it's always dawning the first time you go to Vieira because there are big signs up that warn you about a, a multitude of alligators and fire ants and two different kinds of venomous snakes, rattlesnakes and, and uh, water moccasins. And so uh, when, you, when you first start going there, you usually walk around uh, kind of gingerly, um, watch them where you walk. And after you get to know the park though, it's, it's very safe. Um, and uh, these uh, great blue herons like to nest in the top of these uh, palm trees. And on this day, I came upon this nest, and, and there was just the uh, chick uh, with its head up. And uh, there are actually three chicks in this nest. The other two are asleep. Um, it's unusual to be able to get a, a, a direct shot of a chick because these uh, nests have a lot of sticks in them, and, um, and they tend to obstruct the, the view of the chicks. So I was fortunate to get this. And while I was photographing the chick, this adult flew in. Um, and uh, perched on the nest and, and immediately regurgitated this, this big fish that he was carrying in the pouch below his neck. And uh, what the adults do is they tear these fish into little pieces as these uh, chicks are very young and, and they feed them the pieces. But then as the uh, chicks get older and, and getting towards fledging age, um, they get big enough, they're almost as big as the adults and they're able to eat the whole fish then and uh, and of course eventually they learn how to catch them themselves so um, anyway I, I really like the background here this is um, back to fort de soto and this is one of my favorite birds to photograph this is a reddish egret and um, they come in two types the dark morph which is what we're looking at here with the reddish uh, head and neck and the um, and the gray body and then they also come in a pure white morph, which we're going to see in a few minutes. Um, these birds are a lot of fun, fun to watch and photograph because they, they have a lot of tricks that they use to uh, confuse fish and they catch a lot of fish, um, you know, even in the course of a half hour watching them. Um, but they dance around and they twirl around and they jump up in the air and they, um, and they cast shadows. And what this one is doing is called canopy fishing, which uh, means that uh, he's created an umbrella with his wings and he's created this nice shadow to confuse the fish and uh, you see them do do this quite a bit and uh, this is another high key shot where I, I was shooting into the light so I needed to get an exposure off the bird and uh, just let the uh, background sort of take care of itself and uh, and I really like the uh, reeds as a, as a background here. This bird is actually um, nicknamed Big Red by the locals there. He's, he's been a fixture there at Fort DeSoto for several years, and he's bigger than the, uh, normally um, the reddish egrets get. And, uh, and so the, the, um, the nickname fits, and I always like having a chance to photograph him. Um, this is back to Chincoteague. This is a black-crowned night heron. This is late in the evening, and uh, the bird is, uh, is, is fishing from, from the perch there. Um, it was late in the evening, so I was able to uh, to get some nice light and nice even light. And uh, you can tell this bird has been in the water because his breast is is wet, and uh, so he's been in the water and come out again. I really like the yellow legs on these birds, um, very similar to the uh, purple gallinule that uh, allow them to get around the marsh very easily. Uh, they also have the striking uh, red eye and this white top knot. So I really enjoy photographing these birds. Unfortunately, at Chincoteague, with all of the uh, climate change, the overwash of the salt water, um, the, the salt water's gotten into the um, fresh water and, and consequently these birds have uh, largely moved their habitat inlet. So uh, while I can see them once in a while, they're, they're not as common as they, as they once were and that's kind of disappointing. Back to uh, Nickerson Beach on Long Island. And this is a black skimmer, really striking bird with the black uh, on the wings and then the white under, underbelly and, uh, and under the head. Of course, the, 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 the orange on the beak and on the feet. Uh, they're very striking birds. Um, and they, they have a, a, a long beak with a, 
uh, mandible, lower mandible that's that's like a scoop. So they're able to skim across the top of the water and just uh, uh, stick the scoop in the water and, and scoop up uh, small fish and plant life. And they're really good, very good at uh, catching fish that way. And uh, so you can see these uh, birds skimming uh, up at Chincoteague and in Florida and uh, other places, um, uh, usually in the early summer and midsummer. Um, on this particular day, this uh, uh, there had been, this was on the beach, and there had been a huge storm the day before, and it uh, created this big puddle that was kind of like a bowling alley. And so I was able to swivel my tripod and catch pick up these birds as they as they came in to to start uh, swimming on the water, and just sort of follow them with my tripod as they came by, and uh, try to get the picture as as they came by, and. Uh, it's a lot of fun to to photograph the the skimming, and it takes a little bit of practice. But uh, once you get it, it's it's really fun to do. And of course, I was real happy to get the uh, reflection in the water because I, I always like getting those uh, uh, reflection of the birds. This was back in Orlando, and um, this was a, a snowy egret with the three eggs. And on this particular morning, um, the um, there's a boardwalk that runs through the rookery at, at Gatorland, and uh, the birds build their nests right next to the, the boardwalk. And uh, um, uh, you can see right into the nest. It's, it's really a lot of fun. Um, and of course, the rangers and employees have to watch carefully that people don't stick their hands in the nest, um, which, which some try to do, unfortunately. Um, but this particular morning, I was, I was walking on the boardwalk and saw this snowy egret stand up and um, and I was able to see that she had three eggs, which uh, is unusual. So I set up my tripod and, and my long lens and I waited for her to stand up, which took quite a while. They don't stand up often because they don't wanna overheat the eggs in the sun, but uh, finally she did and I was able to squeeze off a few shots and, uh, and capture the eggs in the feet. Um, when I went to process, I, I really liked the, the central part of this picture, but the the periphery, the nesting material, just didn't didn't uh, didn't work. It was just sort of was sort of drab and blah. So I used a program called Topaz Impression that allows me to uh, sort of de-emphasize the background in the periphery of the photograph and to emphasize the central portion. So um, when I processed, I, I really liked the effect, and uh, so I, I adopted this as my sort of primary version of this uh, photograph. Like I said, unfortunately, I don't go to Gatorland anymore, but uh, um, it, it was really a beautiful place. This is a limpkin. These are pretty common in Florida uh, and in Southern United States. They're beautiful birds, um, you know, with the uh, um, really long, nice curved beak. And uh, these apple snails are really their, their main source of food. And uh, you see in the background this uh, kind of, uh, uh, wiry foliage just sort of covers over the shallow water and the birds just walk around and stick their beak in the in the water until they come up against a, a snail and then they they grab it and pull it out um, and I was lucky enough to capture that and and the bird was cooperative in, the, in that his um, head of course is perpendicular to the, to the camera so I was able to get uh, the bird's head and the snail and the bird's body in, in focus um, which was really nice of him. And uh, because of the curved beak, they're able to get into these shells very quick and pull this meat out. So it takes about probably less than a minute usually for the bird to capture the snail, get the meat out, and then discard the shell. Uh, shell. So, um, you know, I followed this bird around for quite a while before I was able to get this shot. And uh, this is a, a located a boat ramp called Lake Marion off of a, a of a popular birding area called the uh, Joe Overstreet Road. Um, I've been back there probably three or four times and uh, have never been able to um, to capture um, the, these one of these limpkins. Um, uh, but what I have seen there is just huge clouds of mosquitoes. So I finally had to stop going there. I don't see how the, the boaters uh, are able to launch their boats uh, in the middle of all these mosquitoes, but I've seen the limpkins other places and been able to photograph them, just not this particular place. Um, 
Back to Marin Island, this is one of my favorite birds. This is a black neck stilt. Um, they're like the uh, skimmers, they're very striking, the black and white features. And uh, these these birds are kind of scarce, uh, even in Florida. They, they, uh, they're very small, difficult to spot. And, um, and I've been able to find some areas like this one at Merritt Island where they're, they're fairly common. Um, but uh, it took me several years before I even saw one. And uh, uh, now I'm, I'm very happy when, when I come across them. Um, they have these beautiful uh, pink legs that you can't see here, unfortunately, that uh, they're very graceful when they, they cross the marsh and uh, just beautiful birds to photograph. Um, in this case, I was able to get this nice foliage in the water, and uh, uh, in the fall, it, it's sometimes able to get uh, fall colors, like on the upper left, uh, that make for a nice background. Um, and I'll show you another one of these uh, backgrounds further on. This is uh, back to the reddish egret, and this is the white morph. Um, this this bird at the time was the maid of big red. And uh, there are actually two birds here. Big Red is outside of the uh, frame, and uh, and the white morph is following behind him. And uh, I really liked the light this morning. It, it was uh, it was kind of uh, foggy and and just sort of diaphanous light uh, uh, that lit up the eye and and gave me this nice uh, pink on the beak. And I and I really liked the um, the w the way the wings were spread. So I focused on this particular bird, and. Uh, and really like the the lighting here. Unfortunately, the background was was pretty drab in the marsh. So, what I did was I took a um, a, a texture that's made by Flypaper, a company that makes a lot of uh, photographic textures, and uh, I liked it because it it sort of matched the mood of the of the light on the bird, and and I was able to um, uh, do a composite with the uh, texture and the foreground of the bird. And create this uh, background that I, that I really thought really complemented the uh, the lighting of the bird, and uh, um, I mentioned that uh, this bird was the mate of Big Red. Uh, a couple of years ago, she sort of disappeared and apparently went to another location. And uh, um, there there are other white morris there, but this big one um, haven't seen in several years and kind of miss her. This is a wood duck um, photographed in the fall. I've, I've had very little success in the area where I live in locating and photographing uh, wood ducks, and uh, uh, they're they're very reclusive and they tend to to stay in the in the dark woods. And uh, so I had heard about this park called North Chagrin Res Reservation. It's located on a suburb of Cleveland, and uh, was able to join a workshop group there. And I had heard that the um, the wood ducks there were, were rather more acclimated to people and easier to photograph. So uh, I made the long drive up there. And, and apparently they had um, stopped allowing visitors to feed these birds a couple of years before, as, as have most parks have these days. But the birds, as they migrated in and out, for some reason retained the memory of this uh, uh, being acclimated. And so they were still rather, um, rather willing to, to swim out in the open, unlike uh, the, the wood ducks in most areas. So I was able to get some nice uh, photographs on that weekend. Also, this uh, background shows some of the fall colors in the trees, and, uh, and I really enjoy being able to do that. This is a red-winged blackbird. It's one of the most common uh, birds in the, in the U.S., and uh, uh, it's very common in, in Florida, very common in, in Virginia. And actually, my wife and I live on a marsh, and we uh, hear these birds when they come in the in the spring because they have a very distinctive call. And uh, this is a, a male with the, uh, of course, the characteristic orange and yellow on the on the shoulder, and and they're very beautiful birds. Um, they like to uh, perch like this in the marsh, and so a lot of times we can get the vertical shots. Um, they're a little difficult to photograph because of the dark background and it takes some ex um, experience to get the exposure right or some practice um, and some trial and error. Um, this is, as I mentioned, the male, and I'm gonna show you a picture of the female in a minute. Um, this is back at Wakotahatchee uh, Wetlands. 
This is the wood stork. A lot of people think the wood storks are ugly, but I disagree. I think they're very, very beautiful uh, birds, very interesting birds. Um, and I wanted to get a, a shot of this bird bringing in some nesting material, which they do during um, uh, courtship and in, in nest building, of course. And uh, so the bird was flying into the rookery and I was following him as he came in to get the shot. And uh, uh, all of a sudden out of the corner of my eye, I saw this uh, in Hingo reach up and just try to take a, uh, a chunk out of the uh, out of the wood stork's tail and uh, really enjoyed getting that shot. Um, the rookery at Wakota Hatchie and really any big rookery, um, there's a lot of commotion and noise and there are a lot of birds there and they're, they're always overcrowded, a lot of different species and they they screech and they fly in and they fly out and they, they, they just really are a lot of fun to watch. Uh, but because they're crowded, the, some of the birds get kind of chippy sometimes and you see a lot of fights break out and things like this where the birds are nipping at each other. And, and I was really, uh, really glad to capture this shot. Another thing about the rookery in uh, Wakota Hatchie is there are a lot of alligators there and they tend to swim underneath the, uh, underneath the nesting area and they're hoping that uh, the young birds will fall out of the nest so they get a quick meal. Uh, thankfully, I've never seen that happen. I, I've, I've heard that it does happen once in a while. And uh, and I hope I never get to see it, but uh, it's really a lot of fun uh, if you get to even just watch a rookery, whether you are able to photograph it or not. This is another king kingfisher shot. Um, this is one of my favorites. Uh, on this particular day at Chickatiga, I was able to get up uh, you know, fairly close to this bird while he was uh, 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 scanning for fish from a perch. And uh, uh, for a while, he just kept diving into the water and coming back up and he would, his head was away from me or, or he had a, uh, a small fish or something. It wasn't very um, uh, photogenic. And, and all of a sudden he came up and uh, cooperated by uh, turning his head perpendicular to me and uh, with this nice fish and uh, and I was able to get this shot. And you notice how the top knot sort of flattens down when they come up uh, uh, with the fish. And uh, uh, of course, this is a male with uh, um, just the white feathers. And uh, uh, I really enjoyed capturing this uh, photo of the bird and the fish with this nice uh, background. So that's a chickatee. These next two shots, I wanted to show you the uh, the bathing behavior of these turns. These are royal turns, these next two shots, uh, because it's really a lot of fun to watch and photograph. It usually happens after they feed in the morning and uh, and they um, they get out in the water and they and they uh, uh, flap around and they and they fight and they jump around and they they throw water off and it's just really a lot of fun to watch. And this guy's got his top knot up and. Uh, um, as you can see, I was photographing from the water into the nest, so I had, so I had to have the tripod out in the water, uh, which is usually what you have to do to photograph this. Um, but anyway, it, it's a lot of fun to watch this. And then, um, invariably during the bath, um, these these birds will flap and spread their wings fully, and, and shake the water off them. And uh, and of course, if my angle is right, I'll be able to get I'm able to get like this the uh, the full spread of the wings and get some detail on the on the inside of the wings and then also get the head and the beak. And uh, of course, this is again as a royal turn. Um, these are these are always nice shots to get, but it's a very low percentage because uh, you have to time it just right and it's very difficult to uh, anticipate it. So if I take 100 of these, I, I might get one or two that uh, that I like, but uh, they're a lot of fun to, to, to watch and to photograph. Um, this is the female red-winged blackbird, uh, of course, uh, with the, the nest with the two chicks. This was taken at Wakota Hatchie, and the, um, the nest was built out in the marsh, only about two and a half feet off the, off the, the floor of the marsh. And um, this, this photograph actually take me, it took me almost two days to get because the, the, it was very cloudy those two days, and the sun kept coming in and out of the clouds, so the light kept changing. Also, the um, the uh, nest kept swaying in the breeze, and of course, I had to time the the uh, good light with the stationary nest with the same instant where the mother uh, flew in and got the 
chicks to stick their, their uh, heads up. So it took me a lot of patience to get the shot. But also while I was watching it, um, all of a sudden a, a huge great blue heron in the marsh uh, noticed the nest and started coming towards it. And I, and I figured the, the heron would, would get the birds quickly because they were, they were so small in comparison to this huge bird. But all of a sudden, the, the, the parents, the, both the adult and, the, and the, both the, the male and the female, um, just started dive bomb bombing on this, uh, on this great blue heron and, and trying to peck its eyes and screeching and flapping their wings at, at him. And, uh, and all of a sudden, the uh, great blue heron decided there were, there were probably easier ways to get a meal. So he just took off from there and, uh, and uh, I was really impressed with the defensive system that this pair of uh, red winged blackbirds has to protect their nest. And so I can see why they're okay um, um, building them so low to the ground. This is uh, again, Wakota Hatchie at the rookery. I really like to photograph, this, this is a great egret. I really like to photograph these birds coming in with the nesting material. And what I do is uh, there's a particular place where I like to stand to photograph this on the boardwalk. I like to to pick up these birds, um, swivel my tripod as they as they are, are off in the marsh, uh, trying to trying to forage for this uh, nesting material. And then as they get ready to take off, I uh, I try to um, follow them as they come into the nest and try to uh, click the shutter just as they the instant that they um, spread the wings and drop their legs down and they crane their neck up and it, and it's a really um, a nice shot as they uh, just the instant before they drop drop into the nest, and um, I'm always able to get a, a nice um, shot of the in, inside of the uh, wings and the and the feet, and of course the nesting material which uh, they do during courtship and also during uh, nest building. And this is another low percentage shot. Again, uh, if I take 50 of these, I might get one or two where I just capture the right uh, moment, but uh, they they can be really dramatic and and very graceful looking shots. This, this last uh, of this main series is um, also in the Wakoda Hatchie Rookery. It's a pair of course of uh, uh, great uh, blue, blue herons. Um, and uh, of course the male on the right is showing the uh, uh, breeding plumage is all uh, uh, puffed out and uh, the, the top knot is, is raised and uh, uh, you know, the female on the left is is coming in close, and and what the birds do, if you haven't seen them, is they crane their neck and and they uh, they make these motions that are almost like dancing and um, almost like ballet. It's really beautiful to watch. And uh, typically, there are a lot of sticks that get in the way of photographing this, so I was really uh, lucky to be able to get a clear shot of this. And uh, occasionally, they'll make this almost heart shaped motion where the heads come together with the beaks. And uh, and it makes for a really nice uh, photograph. Um, these are these are really beautiful birds to watch, and uh, and this is of course in in the rookery. Um, so that concludes my uh, the main portion of this uh, uh, presentation. There's a lot of information uh, about my website and my email address. Please feel free to email me. Um, there's uh, again, you have, you know, you can stop the the tape and uh, the video anytime and 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 capture this information. There's also information about uh, purchase. Um, and uh, I want to thank Rob Sandy and the Oberndorf Central Library for um, inviting me to participate in this virtual show. Also, want to thank my wife Pat, who was present when many of these photos were taken, and for all her support and logistical talents during our travels. Uh, I also want to thank my daughter, Sarah, who helped me in developing this presentation and for her enthusiastic support of my work. Um, by the way, this uh, great blue heron here, this uh, uh, effect was done with a program called Fractalius with an F and also uh, Topaz Glow. You can get the same effect. And if you have any questions about those uh, programs, just uh, feel free to drop me an email. So I'm going to leave you with this. Uh, Last slide, this is a little blue heron in the marsh at Chincoteague. And now I'm gonna turn it back over to Rob, uh, who has some questions. Uh, Rob, take it away. 
Thanks very much, Scott. Those are beautiful, gorgeous images, really graceful, and also very well composed. It's very impressive, too. And Thank your you. whole presentation was very informative. So we're very pleased to have you here. Uh, I do have a few questions for you. Uh, sure. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about how you learned uh, photography and perhaps related, um, also your fourth generation photographer. Uh, is that when you first started learning? Um, well, I, I um, photography's always been sort of in my blood. My great grandfather started the business and passed it to my grandfather and my uncle took it over. And uh, so when I was growing up visiting in Pennsylvania, um, I spent a lot of time around the dark room in the portrait studio area. So uh, I, I can still sort of smell the uh, chemicals in the dark room. So I've always been interested in photography. And um, as a young adult, I always had a camera, but I didn't really get serious about it until the 2000s when the Eagles started nesting at Norfolk Botanical Gardens. And then I was hooked. And from, from then on, I've been primarily a bird photographer. Um, I, I'm mostly self-taught. I, uh, I have read a lot and I've had a million, watched a million tutorials and I've been to a lot of workshops and, uh, and uh, done, a, done a lot in the field and I've learned from other people. Um, um, taken a few, uh, you know, again, workshops that involve classroom for, for photo processing. And uh, it's just been kind of cumulative, uh, cumulative over the years. Okay, well, very good. And are there any photographers, I mentioned a few uh, in the introduction uh, that have been particularly influential on you and why and how? Well, for bird photography, um, of course, Arthur, Mar Arthur Morris is a legend for in uh, bird photography. And I've, I've, uh, I've always followed his, uh, website and and uh, had a chance to work with him uh, in some workshops um, and uh, Gary Carter is another another person that I've uh, learned a lot about bird photography from but uh, the main person is is someone called Denise Ippolito who's uh, based in New Jersey and she's not only a, a world-class bird photographer but she's a great landscape and uh, uh, she photographs flowers and all all different kinds of subjects but what what uh, what really drew me to her was that she has a really artistic sense. She used to be a florist, and she she just has a real artistic sensibility that she brings to her photographs. So she always seems to to find unique ways to to uh, compose images and to process them. That uh, it, it was uh, I was wanting to bring out that that area of of my work, and uh, so I, I've been working with her in a workshop situation and through through reading all of her books and I've taken some classroom things uh, over the last maybe 10 years and I've learned a lot from her. I think you have succeeded. Your uh, photographs you. are very artistically done, a great eye. Thank you. And you did talk a little bit about the uh, technical side, but I was wondering if perhaps you could give a little more information about camera, lens, other equipment that you use. Sure. I um, I started out as a Nikon photographer, and uh, and I've, I've always liked Nikon equipment. But uh, as I was having to invest um, in more equipment, I, I found that the uh, the uh, Canon uh, products were were pretty much equally uh, technically um, good, and uh, and they were a little bit cheaper. So I, I I moved everything over to Canon, and and while my heart will always be with Nikon, I, I really have enjoyed using uh, Canon equipment. Um, so I've got about five Canon cameras right now that I use for various things and uh, in a number of lenses. Uh, for tripods, I I always use, uh, or I, I use carbon fiber tripods because they're much lighter. And as I get older, um, that gets more and more important. And uh, and so I use uh, a one that's made by Gitzo and one that's made by Endura. And, and I really enjoy, um, using those because they're excellent products. Um, I uh, do processing in, in Photoshop. I've never learned to use Lightroom because um, I'm a little old, old, old to learn new tricks, um, but uh, uh, I really enjoy um, using Photoshop. And I think that's uh, equally as important with uh, 
going out into the field is is the processing that happens afterwards. I've, I've uh, just what might want to mention. Uh, people are getting into mirrorless cameras these days, and I haven't done that yet, but I'd like to eventually because again, as I as I get older, um, the the lighter weight is very important to me. So I can see myself sort of migrating over to at least getting one mirrorless camera, probably a, a Sony or a Canon um, in the near future. Okay, sounds good. And do you have a preferred surface on which to uh, print your photographs or does it vary from the type or? Uh, I've, I've experimented with some different things, Matt, finishes and, and even watercolor, but I keep coming back to the glossy photos, um, glossy paper. It, uh, it just seems to, to showcase the, the photographs uh, the best. And, and I know you get 10 people and you get 10 different opinions, but uh, I like to, to print fairly large. Um, I like to print up to uh, 11 by 14 and then, and then mat one size larger. Um, I use an Epson. P400 printer that uh, allows me to print up to 13 by 19 inches um, with really good quality. And, uh, and so really the, the glossy is, is uh, what I use most often. Okay. And behind these wonderful images, there is a lot of work and thought that goes into it. With the uh, great egret uh, photograph, I believe you mentioned 50 shots, I think. Is that uh, normal, or um, what is your process for that? Um, well, these days with the uh, digital photography, it really doesn't matter. I can I can remember when uh, photographs um, we had to get printed were were twenty five cents a pop, and uh, these days with the the digital, um, you you can really take an unlimited number of shots. Um, Without costing more or less, as long as you've invested already in the in the digital medium. So um, it, it just depends on the subject and the day. Some days I may go out and come back with uh, 50 pictures, and other days I may come back with thousands. Um, because with with my rig being able to take uh, seven frames per second, um, if I'm shooting a lot of movement, I I could easily take uh, um, hundreds and hundreds of shots in in the course of an hour. Uh, so it really depends on the situation. The problem is that uh, the more I take, the more I've got to go through. So, um, you know, less is less is more in some ways. Sure. Um, okay, great. Um, and also, you have a nice array of birds in your presentation. I, I was wondering if there are any other type of birds that you have not photographed yet, or places. That you would like to visit to uh, photograph birds. I I love photographing hummingbirds, and I um, I uh, went back and forth on including a couple of those in these. And uh, um, I, I would really like to go to a place like there are places in Texas where they have a lot of different species. I'd love to go back to Costa Rica. Uh, the one time I was there, I didn't have my bird equipment with me, and. Uh, and uh, really wasn't as far along when I went there. So I'd love to go back someday and photograph particularly hummingbirds, but also the wide range of species that uh, that we don't have here. For example, they have a lemon heron that's, uh, that's just beautiful that I would love to be able to photograph. Sounds nice. Do you have any advice for aspiring photographers? Just, um, you know, read everything you can. Watch the there are a million tutorials on uh, on YouTube these days. Um, you know, take classes, uh, go to workshops, learn from people. Um, I, I used to, when I was learning bird photography, I I hung out with uh, folks that like to photograph eagles, and I learned a lot about uh, photographing eagles just from talking to them and 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 asking how how they did particular things. So so that's what I would suggest. Just uh, just be relentless about pursuing it and uh, and really, um, you know, learning wherever you can and, and find your niche or niches, uh, but don't be afraid to do some different things. Very good advice. Uh, I was wondering also about uh, any future plans in photography or any goals that you have for the near future. Um, I just, I want to continue to, to learn and grow. Um, I, I've, 
I have gotten very interested in landscape photography, um, not to the degree that I like bird photography, but I'm just fascinated. And, and since I've been taking trips in recent years out west, I, I've wanted to do more and more of that. So next year, my wife and I are going to uh, Yellowstone and, and Grand Tetons, and as well as going to Florida for bird photography. And I'd really like to explore that area and uh, um, not only just out west, but just uh, learning more about landscape photography and getting better at it. Sounds good. And I know that you will uh, do well in whatever your endeavors are. Uh, we thank you again for uh, presenting your wonderful photography uh, today, and we wish you very good luck in the future. Uh, we also thank uh, all of our viewers uh, for joining us as well. We hope you'll join us again next month when Debbie Ann Moore, a contemporary realist oil painter who uh, paints uh, figurative work and also still life, will be joining us. So we'll be back then. Thank you, Robert.